The unnamed cliff house nested high on a ledge, reached only by a stiff climb from the canyon bottom, first through matted underbrush, then up a sandy, rocky talus. Richard, who had been there once before, had recommended this as a good place to start, but had not recommended the alkaline spring near the camp below. The spring was the baron's first encounter with alkali. The taste, he said, was nauseous. The site where they were contained a nine-room house with two small kivas. After they'd worked most of the rooms, Norton scold called a halt. Very good, he said. Now you think we should try something ambitious? It was early July, a time when the ranch demanded their attention, so Richard and Al reluctantly retired in favor of their brother John, who, for the remainder of the summer, was Norton scold's capable foreman. To help him, he had at first two, then three, then four laborers hired by the baron. For something ambitious, Nornskold chose Longhouse, concentrating his efforts there for one month, without any particularly good results. His failure to obtain more specimens from Longhouse was due to the dilapidated condition of the cliff dwelling, with the result that long labor was necessary to reach the floors where we might expect to find the most numerous objects. The baron was impressed by the fact that Longhouse was in far more ruinous condition than the other major cliff villages. He offered, as possible explanation for this, his theory that Longhouse might have been sacked and pillaged by an enemy. Though the inhabitants were adm admirably prepared for defense, there still are many indications to suggest they were eventually succumbed to their enemies. Human bones, ribs, vertebrae, etc., are strewn in numbers here and there among the ruins. In the time remaining, from August 14th to September 14th, Nordenskold worked at Kodak House, Mug House, Step House, and Spruce Tree House, likewise investigating a number of smaller ruins. Engaging another laborer to work under John's supervision, he spent two weeks at Kodak House, but again was disappointed by the scarcity of material. Only a few days were given to digging at Mug House and Spruce Tree House, but in Step House he was rewarded by finding a large quantity of pottery and a number of burials. As the digging proceeded, Nornsgold measured the ruins, photographed them, diagrammed the floor plans, and carefully took notes on the details of architecture as well as of the relics. In some way, he found time, in addition to everything else, to trench the mound of a partially buried surface ruin on a point of the mesa overlooking Cliff Palace, the ruin which Fuchs later excavated and named ambiguously Sun Temple. At Spruce Tree House, he anticipated the tree ring dating method of the American astronomer A. E. Douglas by counting 162 annual growth rings on a spruce tree growing through the masonry wall. Thus, he came to the conclusion that Spruce Tree House was at least 200 years old. An occasional visitor reached Norton's Gold Camp on the mesa between Rock and Long Canyons. One of these visitors, an eastern tourist whom Richard brought in and introduced as Dr. W. R. Birdsall, remained several days after expressing deep interest in the work. A few months after Birdsall's departure, the American Geographical Society published a paper written by the doctor, which Nordenskold admitted was the best description yet published of the ruins of Mesa Verde. It was the writer's good fortune, Birdsall wrote, to visit the region, thus briefly described under the guidance of Richard, Alfred, and John Wetherill during the summer of 1891, for recreation rather than for the purpose of systematic archaeological study. For several years, these men have devoted a great deal of time to the exploration of this region in search of cliff houses and the relics they contain. Although not professional archaeologists, they have amassed a very large collection of the remains of the cliff dwellers and are in possession of a vast number of observations and facts concerning them. Indeed, no one knows this part of the Mesa Verde as they do. The upper end of Mancos Canyon is the usual place which tourists see. A few example of cliff houses and the hospitable Wazerill Ranch is a proper outfitting place. Baron Nordskull reflected an appreciation, too. The mesa on which he camped in the summer he named Wetherill Mesa, after the brothers Wetherill who have done so much service in the exploration of these regions, and, and whose knowledge of Mesa Verde has given me such valuable assistance. Elsewhere, he remarked, During the course of years, Richard and Alfred Wetherill have explored Mesa Verde and its canyons in all directions. They have thus gained a more thorough knowledge of its ruins than anyone. As his duties on the ranch allowed, Richard carefully observed Nornskold's progress and his methods, sometimes joining laborers in digging. 
Both men wanted to know where the large population of Cliff Palace, during a century of occupation, had buried its dead. It was here that the question of burial customs first presented itself to Richard. At Cliff Palace and at Step House, Richard already had come across a few skeletons of the ancient people with pottery and other grave furnishings laid to rest with them, either buried within the caves or in the trash mounds on the slopes below. But the number found was astonishingly small. Far back in the cave of Cliff Palace, Richard told Nornsgold, among the few skeleton burials, he had found human bones of bodies he knew had been cremated or at least burned. Would that indicate the people of Cliff Palace had practiced cremation on a wide scale? Nornsgold thought not. If they had, there would probably be more evidence of it. Down among the rocks below the cave, he said, they probably would find more. At Step House, Nornskold poked into the trash mound south of the Cliff Village and turned up a crude type of pottery quite unlike the highly finished ware of the Cliff Dwellers. Very possibly the crude vessels belonged to an older race, he said, not realizing how close he was to an important archaeological discovery. Perhaps they were the work of people who inhabited Step House Cave before the erection of the Cliff Village. Afterward, Richard and his brothers found more of the crude pottery in the same cave. They came to the same tentative conclusion, but turned another direction without probing further. The subject of the discussion between Richard and his Swedish friend was that of the large circular rooms, nearly all of them, either subterranean or built below floor level, and found in all of the cliff dwellings of any size. Estufas, Richard called them, using the Spanish word. These circular rooms, built with a fire pit in the middle of the floor, sometimes had a low stone bench extending around the wall. The rooms had an average depth of about eight or ten feet, and some were eight to twenty feet in diameter. At Mesa Verde, they were usually six masonry pilasters, evenly spaced and riving from the circular bench to support a cribbed roof of logs. Some of the early explorers of prehistoric ruins in the southwest, applying mistaken logic to the ancient architecture, decided these were tanks built to catch and store water. In his discussions with Baron Nordensgold, Richard recognized the circular rooms as earlier counterparts of the same rooms found in modern pueblos, the meeting places, reserved almost without exception, for the village numerous male clans or societies, and used primarily for ceremonial or religious occasions. Richard referred to them as estufas, although before his death the Hopi name Kiva was introduced and in time won preference. On one occasion Richard Stubble scraped against the side of a pottery bowl. He continued to dig around it, but more carefully. Norn Skold had been watching and now stepped forward. No, Richard, like this. And with a mason's trowel Norn Skold picked and scraped gently at the earth, impounding the bowl. Why waste all that time? Richard finally asked. Intent on what he was doing, the young archaeologist went on working until the fragile vessel, without a crack marring its surface, stood free. He lifted it then, as gently as though he were an obstetrician with a newborn baby. This way, Richard, you save time. You don't waste. After that, Richard used the mason's trowel. The relics taken from the quip dwellings that summer were packed to the Alamo Ranch by Burrow and sorted out for crating. Meanwhile, in August, while John and the laborers continued to work, Nornskold left with Al Wetherill as his guide for the Hopi Pueblos to the south. Accompanied by Roe Etheridge, a cowboy who worked with his brother Jim at the Wetherill Ranch, they traveled by horseback to First Mesa for the snake deaths at Walpi, returning early in September as the cool touches of fall began to be felt in Mancos Valley. Two weeks later, the Baron departed for Durango, this time riding in a weather buckboard and followed by a wagon loaded with relics of the cliff dwellers. On his arrival, however, he was served with a warrant by the county sheriff. News of the summer's work had spread. A committee of Durango townspeople, incensed that a foreigner should be taking a wagon load of antiquities out of the country, had protested. The young scientist's boxes were seized. A hearing in the case was set for two weeks ahead, and Nordskold returned to the Alamo Ranch, rendering that the results of his hard labor were lost. He used the time to take more photographs of the cliff dwellings and enlarge, the considerably, enlarge considerably on his notes on Cliff Palace. And I feel like New York City. Get me to the farm